Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you here in the room. Just to make sure that you're in the right place, I would like to welcome you to the session on high HIV incidents for AGYW, adolescent girls, young women. What are the programming gaps? Everyone is in the right place, right? And you're excited about the session, yes? Excellent. Wow, this is good energy. I don't know if it's before or after lunch, but thank you. Very quickly, I am happy to be one of the co-chairs for this session. My name is Annalise Lim. I am with USAID headquarters in Washington, D.C. I am one of the senior youth and HIV advisors, and the bulk of my portfolio is managing the USAID DREAMS programming. So it is really an honor to be here as part of this session. I would like to turn it over to my co-chair now to introduce herself as well. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Kukule Tsungubane. I'm from the Oram Institute in South Africa. I'm a group HIV senior special, technical specialist. I'm also a public health physician. And my passion is really on women and children. Uh, my greatest program is PMTCT. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to do a brief introduction of our speakers. After that, each speaker will present for 10 minutes, and then we hope to have ample time for questions from the audience. So as I introduce you speakers, if you could wave. Um, first, we have Monica Chibisekunda, who is an HIV testing services and prevention medical mentor at Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia under Proud Z in Lusaka. Next, we have Dr. Constance Mackworth-Young. Constance is a medical anthropologist and assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She is based in Harare with a health research unit Zimbabwe, where she founded and leads the Social Science Research Group. Next, we have Dr. Natsaya Chambindi. Natsaya is a faculty member and a Wellcome Trust International Training Fellow at the Africa Health Research Institute and an honorary associate professor at the Institute of Global Health University College London. Let's give a warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. So if we could pull up the slides for our first presenter, please, and I will turn it over to Constance. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Annalise, and thank you to all for being here. So I was particularly interested to talk on this panel because I feel passionately about adolescents and young people and about what we can do to meet their needs. In particular, I felt so inspired um, in one of the sessions yesterday afternoon listening to Precious Shongwe from the Eswatini Network of Young Positives saying, and this is my notes from what she said yesterday, we look at young women as medical beings. I have bigger problems before we talk about condoms or treatment. Most pro programs are looking into medical parts, but not the real issues of adolescent girls and young women. Are we about quality services or are we about pushing targets for adolescent girls and young women? And that really hit home to me. Much of my work involves trying to forefront the stories of adolescents and young people and situate their experiences around HIV in the context of their broader lives. And it is that that I want to bring into the discussion today. Next slide, please. In thinking about high HIV incidents amongst adolescent girls and young women, I want to start with the story of Rhoda, the pseudonym of a young woman with whom I conducted research with over four years. During that time, she was constantly balancing different risks and priorities, as this quote exemplifies. College is so important to me. I just know I will make it and become a nurse one day and be able to support my young brother. I have been managing the fees with the bursary, but now my mum is struggling to pay the fees and there are extra costs like the ID badge and blankets. I have to ask my father's cousin, even my auntie. I can really understand why some girls sell their bodies. You've just got to find a way to pay. Here, Rhoda is acutely aware of the risks. The risk of HIV competes with the other risks in her life. She's making rational choices to balance her education, supporting her brother, managing relationships, and the long-term security that she hopes to find through education and getting a job. Next slide, please. 
Rhoda is one of the many adolescents and young women with whom I've conducted ethnographic and qualitative work over the last decade in Zambia and Zimbabwe. I will draw on two main bodies of work here. Firstly, ethnographic research that I conducted in Lusaka, Zambia, with young women living with HIV over 12 months in their homes, colleges, churches, clinics, and with their families, friends, and partners. It included making collages with the, these young women to visually depict their lives and priorities. Secondly, qualitative research within HIV and sexual and reproductive health trials and intervention studies in Zimbabwe, where we've conducted interviews, participant observations, and participatory workshops with adolescents, young people, and key stakeholders to understand how health services are experienced. The particular intervention that I will draw on here today is Chiedza, a community-based integrated HIV and sexual and reproductive health intervention delivered in 12 communities across Zimbabwe, which received 78,000 visits by young people over 30 months. Next slide, please. Rhoda's story exemplifies some of the competing priorities that adolescent girls and young women face and balance on a daily basis. The incredible successes of HIV over the last two to three decades have meant that at an individual and community level, even in highly affected HIV areas, HIV is mostly not adolescent girls and young women's primary concern. And is actually now often seen as a condition which one can receive high quality care and treatment for due to the incredible investment that there has been in HIV. And this often contrasts to other conditions where healthcare is either unavailable, substandard, or at a high personal cost. So even with adolescent girls who are living with HIV, with whom I have worked, they strongly emphasize that HIV is one part of their identity, but only one. When we made collages um, together as a visual demonstration of themselves, their lives, and their priorities, adolescent girls living with HIV emphasized the importance of faith, family, friends, school, boyfriends, students, uh, uh, and college, alongside their experiences with HIV. They emphasize their identities as sisters, girlfriends, students, Christians, over their identity as living with HIV. They talked about their priorities, food, education, relationships, income. While HIV is certainly one part of their identity, they certainly don't define themselves by their HIV status. Next slide, please. Unlike HIV, which can more easily be hidden, Pregnancy is something that adolescent girls and young women face that cannot be hidden and that can cause substantial disruption to their life trajectory. In Zimbabwe, a repeated theme is the number and impact of unintended and unwanted pregnancy among adolescent girls and young women and about the major implication that that has on this, their lives. So, th so this quote saying, I dropped out of school when I got pregnant. All that is over for me now. I can't go back. With a historically singular and successful focus on HIV, this has meant that antiretroviral therapy and increasingly pre-exposure prophylaxis is available and accessible at public health facilities. Contraception to prevent unwanted pregnancies is often inaccessible, either because of unavailability, cost to the individual, in Zimbabwe it's not, it's not always free, and social stigma. So in this quote saying, before having my child, I didn't use anything to prevent myself from getting pregnant. Young girls must not take family planning pills if they are not married. So really emphasizing the kind of social environment that prevents taking contraception. Next slide, please. So in amongst this honeycomb of interlinked risks and priorities, HIV is one piece, but only one piece. And often due to the impressive success of the HIV effort, it is the one that can actually most often be, meet, most easily be hidden, treated, and controlled. Next slide. So, given these competing identities and priorities, how should we program? A first step in my mind is really seeking to understand and legitimize the risks and priorities that adolescent, young, adolescent girls and young women themselves experience as priorities, and supporting these as our priorities. And then we can consider, as, then we, and then link what we consider as public health priorities to women's own priorities. Having something that appeals to their direct priorities and meet them where their priorities are at, alongside the public health priorities. 
Next slide, please. One example where I feel that we did this effectively is in Chiedza, the integrated community-based intervention I mentioned earlier. Here, an integrated package of sexual and reproductive health services were offered to young people, which included HIV and SCI testing and treatment, menstrual hygiene products and care, condoms, contraception, an information um, system through, through text messages alongside other services. There was high acceptability of the intervention, with 96% of the adolescents and young people who came rating their overall engagement with Chiedza as either excellent or very good. And a key reason for this high acceptability is that Chiedza provided a one-stop shop with several of adolescents and young people's needs met in the same place. In particular, we found that providing free menstrual hygiene products in a context where they are prohibitively expensive for many to buy, was a real draw for young women to attend. This was a product that young women wanted and needed, but were not able to pay to access. So it drew them to Chiedza. Then, while they were there, they were able to take up other sexual and reproductive health services. So I read this quote saying, I came wanting pads. Pads are so expensive nowadays, and they were giving them for free. And then I also got tested for HIV. And this young woman at that point tested positive for HIV and was able to be linked onto treatment and care. Next slide, please. Attendance, so attendance to a chiedza was facilitated by particular services, or hooks as we called them. Before attending the service, several clients described feeling fearful of HIV and SCI testing. But once they came, attracted by those hooks, they received supportive counseling from providers. For many clients, it was this infrastructure of support that enabled them to overcome their fears and engage in testing once they were actually there. So this quote saying, before I first came here, I am one person who was afraid to get tested, but I got a full explanation of the benefits of knowing my status once he was there. Although most young people reported that they came to Chiedza for other services, 78% of those eligible for HIV testing took up HIV testing on the first visit, and another 54% of people who came back to the service took up HIV testing on subsequent visits. So here I, find, I feel that Chiedza demonstrated the feasibility and value of providing integrated services that both meet adolescents and young people at their priorities and also meet public health priorities at the same time. Next slide. So although this session is definitely on adolescent girls and young women, I wanted to touch on men. If we want to address HIV among adolescent girls and young women, we cannot look at them as an isolated population. We also have to work to provide services for men. But we know that male attendance and male uptake of health services is a continual issue. A part of this is due to men's competing priorities around economics and income, as this quote demonstrates. I would have come, but I haven't made any money today. I've got to hustle, and only then can I think about my health. But I just don't think I will have time. The time and money required for accessing health services competes with other priorities that these young men have. In Chiedza, we try to broaden services and attract men and, and attractions for men by offering boxer shorts and uh, haircuts. Next slide. But I want to challenge us, all of us in the room, to go further and meet adolescents where they view their priorities are. Partnering with educational and skills programs, looking towards microfinance and cash, tra cash transfers, to have more holistic services for adolescents that not only meet their HIV and sexual and reproductive health needs, but also their other priorities around employability, education, skills, income, and social support. Next slide. I want to end on this message of really understanding adolescent girls and young women's risks and priorities first, and those of their partners, and designing programs and services that address those needs, and only then seeing how they can be integrated and aligned with public health priorities. As such, I think we will end up with more integrated, strength-based programs which meet adolescent girls and young women at their own priorities alongside public health priorities. And then if we move forward, and then if we move forward that we need to challenge ourselves as researchers 
to develop and use broader outcomes that centre measurement of the broader priorities that adolescent and girls and young women face alongside the HIV outcomes. Next slide, please. So just to say thank you to all the participants and wonderful colleagues with whom I'm lucky enough to work, and thank you to you all for listening. Thank you so much, Constance. We are right on time as well. Thank you. If we could pull up our next slides, please, for Natsai. Can everyone in the back hear okay? I do hear some noise from the adjoining room. Are you okay in the back? Can you hear? Will someone in the back confirm they can hear? Thank you. Okay, over to you, Natsai. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Annalise. And um, thank you, Constance, my co-panelist, for doing a great job and also making my work much easier because we share a lot of our experiences, even though it's across different countries. I'm going to talk about our experiences in South Africa. So I'm just going to be looking at um, looking back and looking into the future, the decline in HIV incidence uh, for adolescent girls and young women in rural South Africa, just looking at the lessons that we have learned over time for programming. Next slide, please. So despite the availability of effective HIV prevention interventions, young people remain at highest risk and incidence of HIV infection, especially young women in rural KwaZulu-Natal. And while the unmet sexual health needs and uh, STI rates and teenage rates remain high in our uh, rural context, we find that um, community-based health promotion by area-based uh, peer navigators feasible in reaching young people with SRIH services, as I'm going to indicate later on. Next slide, please. So here we aim to understand the implications of the changing HIV incidence for the development of HIV programs for young people in our rural KwaZulu-Natal setting. And here at this talk, I would like to demonstrate how we co-developed community-based sexual reproductive health and HIV programs for young people to respond to their needs. Next slide, please. So a bit about our context and setting. The Africa Health Research Institute is uh, situated in the northern KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, 200 kilometers north of Durban, as shown on the map. So this is a health and demographic surveillance site which we've been running for more than 20 years, and we conduct annual HIV surveillance over uh, a total population of about 90,000 individuals. So at any given point, we have got 60,000 resident adult individuals that we can conduct HIV surveillance on. So this district is rural and poor with a high burden of HIV as well as um, it was selected for the paper funded DREAMS HIV um, uh, interventions for adolescent girls and young women in 2016 and prior to this there were very limited targeted SRIH and HIV interventions for young people in our setting. Next slide please. So I'm just going to draw from um, several data sets uh, of uh, work that we have done, implementation science research studies that we conducted in the context of a long-standing health and demographic surveillance si uh, survey from the period of 2016 to 2023. And this included a mixed method impact evaluation of the DREAMS multi-level HIV prevention implemented by the PEPFAR, a two by two factorial individual uh, randomized cluster trial of um, integrating ST into sexual reproductive health to create demand for PrEP among 15 to 30 year old young people and also a stepwise trial uh, of peer-led biosocial interventions integrated into HIV and SRIH adolescent youth friendly services to assess health HIV outcomes. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how we've expanded a multi-component intervention into schools, which I'm going to elaborate more as my case study later on. Next slide, please. So the graph here shows the HIV incidence rate for the period since DREAMS implementation began in our study area, looking at the 2000 to 2016, which is shaded in blue. And here we see that the rates of HIV incidence among adolescent girls and young women uh, were lower in both age groups, the 15 to 19 in green and the 20 to 24 in orange. And the dotted lines here represent the confidence intervals. 
So what we see here is that the decline was most likely to have, and uh, this is five years prior to DREAMS uh, being rolled out in our setting. So the decline we see here is most likely to have been dri driven by improvements in the HIV services and treatment, your ART and your voluntary medical male circumcision. However, one take home message is that HIV risk for adolescent girls and young women still remains high in our setting. Next slide, please. And when we look at uh, the risk of HIV and HSV2 hep simplex virus to acquisition among young women who sell sex, so we've been hearing a lot about uh, the marginalized and the key populations that are still remaining among adolescent girls and young women in our, in our area and um, in sub-Saharan broadly. When we look at adolescent girls and young women aged 18 to 29, we found strong evidence of association between selling sex and HIV uh, and HSV2 acquisition. With adolescent girls and young women who are selling sex, having almost three times the risk of HIV acquisition and almost twice the risk of HSV2 acquisition compared to adolescent girls and young women who were not uh, selling sex. So this is a, re a big uh, burden of disease among adolescent girls and young women in our setting. Uh, click for me, please. And when we look to, at the time to event graphs, which show, um, they show high HIV and HSV2 incidents among young women who sell sex, the blue bar compared to the orange bar. So we see again that the burden of disease is high among young women who sell sex. Next slide, please. Moving over to the two by two factorial trial is Seculos and Pilo that I've indicated. Young women who uh, are young people were aged 15 to 30 years old were randomly allocated to four arms, which you can see on the legend on your right. Uh, the first one, which is the standard of care, which was an enhanced mobile adolescent youth friendly services, which are provided by our research group, and the SRIH, which was a baseline self collected urine sample or a self uh, swabbed vaginal sample for STI testing. And here we're testing for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas. And the third group, which was peer support, where one um, could be allocated a peer navigator to help them navigate their health systems and also access, uh, linkage to uh, healthcare facilities. And the fourth group, which was a combination of all three. And what we found is that STI testing and SRIH increased uptake of differentiated HIV prevention and care among young people. And again, going back to what Constance has spoken about, the hooks that hook young people into our prevention services. As shown by the red and the orange lines, which you can see there, those who were randomized to the SRIH and the STI testing had 60% higher odds of linking into adolescent youth-friendly services. And we also found that STI rates uh, were very high and common in this group, and particularly among uh, young women where we have a rate of 30%. Next slide, please. And looking at one case study where we're looking at leveraging other platforms for community intervention delivery, such as schools, and this is a place where young people spend most of their times at, and uh, this is where uh, behaviors are being built and being reinforced. We use a participatory method approach to uh, co-adapt a multi-level whole school sexual health promotion program called Safer Choices to improve SRH and HIV prevention uptake among high school learners within our community, as well as to optimize provision of biomedical services within this group in this rural context. So as you can see for the, from the components and the activities that are involved, this is um, a complex intervention and involves uh, community-wide and family-wide and individual-wide uh, activities. And so we use a participatory approach to engage learners, school leadership, our, our teachers, our principals, our heads of department, stakeholders from the Department of Education so that we can get their buy-in, parents, guardians, and community members that are served by these schools in workshops and discussions to co-adapt the program to understand the context and the valid and social validity here we're looking at its acceptability its appropriateness before rolling it out into these communities and the uh, and including understanding in greater depth the srih needs for learners in our setting next slide please so from the core adaptation work we did with Safer Choices was found to be relevant for learners in a context of high sexual risk and vulnerability. 
The content was appropriate and relatable and provided learners with information and skills on how to protect themselves. So this is just not a curriculum-based um, intervention, but it also provides them with skills on how to negotiate safer sex, how to delay sex, how to um, be, uh, build relationships and, uh, and change social norms and gender norms in this community. We found that stakeholder engagement is key in core adaptation of interventions, but it needs to be continuous and consistent for it to be effective and sustainable. Learners and parents welcomed a school-based SRH program that includes parents, particularly if it tackled wider well-being and access to biomedical services. Promotion of HIV and SRH in schools was acceptable, and services were indicated that they should be provided in and around uh, schools and go beyond just SRH and HIV services, as Constance has indicated, for them to be less stigmatizing and accessible to young people that they may not be identified as sexually active. Last, there were suggestions for the program to include enrichment and self-development initiatives, such as driving lessons, choirs, dramas, and other activities that can generate income for these poor resource schools. And next slide, please. One other thing that we learned was that context is important. So due to the large class sizes of about 200 learners per grade in some of these poor schools, we learned that we needed to compress our curriculum-based activities from 21 to 11 um, sessions and also utilize peer, local peer navigators. We're already working in these areas to support teachers and peers to deliver safer choices. And this indicates some of the programming challenges that are in these poor and limited resource schools. Last slide. In conclusion, as HIV incidence is declining in our setting, reaching the most vulnerable adolescent girls and young women, including young women who sell sex with effective HIV prevention, becomes a challenge. We found that community-based STI testing and integration of HIV with uh, sexual reproductive health attracts adolescent girls and young women into differentiated HIV prevention. Lastly, Safer Choices, a multi-component school-based program, was found to be relevant and acceptable for learners in a context of high sexual risk and vulnerability. I would like to thank, um, last slide, thank you so much for your time and your attention. I'd like to thank all the teams and the learners in the schools that were involved in this work. Thank you. Thank you very much for another thought-provoking and excellent presentation. And we will turn to our third presenter now. Um, if we could have Monica's slides pulled up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annalise, and thank you all for attending this. Good afternoon. I will be discussing utilizing recency surveillance data to reach adolescent girls and young women, and we'll be focusing on the programming gaps. Next slide. As we've heard from all the panelists, and I'm sure we can all agree that adolescent girls and young women face unique challenges related to sexual and reproductive health, including a higher risk of HIV infection. According to the 2021 preliminary results of the Zambia population-based HIV AIDS impact assess assessment, ZAMFIA, adolescent girls and young women are lagging behind in achieving the 95-95-95 UN AIDS set targets. Despite all the progress made, uh, there's still challenges in programming that persist. And utilization of recency surveillance data is an innovative approach to inform targeted intervention. Next slide. Zambia is among the countries that are implementing surveillance of recent HIV infections to target public health response. Since 2021, the Ministry of Health in Zambia, through the HIV Recency Surveillance Program, has been monitoring demographic characteristics of recent HIV infections, identifying geographical areas of active transmission, and implementing baseline viral load testing as the standard of care. A recent infection is one that is considered to be acquired within 12 months and a long-term infection more than 12 months ago. We conducted an analysis to identify potential hotspots of recent HIV infections using routine surveillance data 
in Lusaka province and informed the targeting of generalized intensified control and prevention interventions. Next slide. So this is a description of the HIV recent infection algorithm in Zambia. The algorithm begins with initial testing of a client accessing HIV testing services. A rapid test is done. Once the test is positive, a confirmatory test is conducted. A confirmed positive test is then reported as positive under routine case finding strategies in the national database. Samples that are confirmed positive further undergo testing for recent infection and baseline viral load. A recent infection is reported as such to the national surveillance and monitoring and evaluation systems if it's confirmed recent and the baseline viral load is more than or equal to 1,000 copies per mil. Next slide. The six-step approach in the public health response is a systematic and comprehensive method of addressing identified hotspots. The first step involves identification of possible transmission hotspots. Data is then confirmed and the hotspot is further described. Preparation involves stakeholder en engagement at provincial, district, and health facility level. An investigation is conducted using tools that are developed and recommendations are made, are made based on identified gaps and solutions that are implemented to strengthen public health programs. Finally, the public health response is closed after a period of monitoring progress. Next slide. So this map um, indicates two significant hotspots of recent HIV infection identified using a SAT scan in Lusaka province. They are shown by the two pink circles. In the larger circle at the bottom of the map, seven health facilities were identified, two of which are focused for the public health response in this presentation. Next slide. The table on the right shows the proportion of Rita recent by age group and gender. The overall proportion of Rita recent was 7% and younger age groups 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 years showed a higher Rita recent proportion, uh, higher Rita recent proportions with 16% and 12% respectively. At the bottom of the table, we see that females had a higher Rita recent proportion of 8% compared to males uh, with a 5% Rita recent proportion. So a public health action is then triggered when the observed number of recent infections at a facility is statistically higher than they expected. This is calculated using a weighted regression method in SATSCAN software. Of note is that the public health response is generalized. Next slide. This is a snapshot of a recent um, infection surveillance site assessment form that was developed. And uh, the sections include demographics, institutional organization, and the surrounding community, and services offered by the health facility, including DSD um, services that are offered for key and priority populations, including adolescent services. Next slide. So some of the gaps identified include, included inadequate number of adolescent peers providing services in the youth-friendly spaces and conducting safe and ethical index testing in MCH. These adolescents were not trained in the adolescent HIV package. Those poor distribution of HIV self-test kits due to an erratic supply at that time in the province and capacity building. Those poor linkage of identified high-risk negative adolescent girls and young women to prevention services. And there was a lack of a key, a key population hub in the catchment area. So to mitigate this, adolescent peers were identified and placed in the youth-friendly spaces and in MCH. Capacity building was done in the adolescent HIV package. HIV self-testing and targeted testing in collaboration with the provincial health office. A system was put in place in the health facility to escort identified high-risk negative adolescent girls and young women to receive targeted testing interventions and prevention services from the youth-friendly spaces. And finally, stakeholders were engaged and the key population hub was 
opened in the catchment area. Next slide. The table on the left highlights results from the social network testing conducted at the at facility and community level as part of targeted testing interventions. The results show within a month at one of the public health response sites um, how 42 social networks were reached at both facility and community levels. 165 adolescent and young people were tested for HIV and 10 were identified positive and linked to treatment. On the right side of the slide, we see spiking numbers in index testing. So adolescents and, adolescents and young persons were reached through safe and ethical index testing, especially adolescent girls and young women. And that is highlighted by the blue bars after launching the public health response. Next slide. This graph highlights the increase in PrEP uptake after launching the public health response. And we can see, again, highlighted by the blue bars, that uh, PrEP uptake was increased amongst adolescent girls and young women. Interestingly, an analysis in Lusaka using data up to June 2023 does not show the two public health response facilities as hotspots anymore. Next slide. Regardless of the strides made, there are still ongoing gaps. There have been challenges with incomplete and inconsistent data generated at health facility level. Despite the ability of recency surveillance data to inform policy and resource allocation, it does not capture and, uh, the factors that recognize the diverse needs and unique challenges that are faced by this vulnerable group, as highlighted by Constance. A gap still remains in the number of trained staff providing appropriate care to adolescent girls and young women. There's a lack of age appropriate messaging in the health facilities and youth friendly spaces. And even though these two facilities provide 24 hour services, youth friendly services are only provided a few hours on specific days. Next slide. In conclusion, recency surveillance data is useful for identifying hotspots for recent infections and age groups that are affected. Targeted testing and prevention interventions must be implemented by a multidisciplinary team as part of the public health response. Adolescent girls and young women must be referred to appropriate services to address their specific needs and challenges. And recency hotspot mapping facilitates precision public health in limited resource settings. Finally, I just want to thank my team members, my support system here, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And you all ended exactly 10 minutes each. That has never happened. So well done. That means we do have time for some questions. Um, I do have a colleague in the audience who's going to help with the microphone. I do ask that please refrain from commentary. I know we like to do that, but have a succinct question. And if you would like to direct it to someone or the panel, if you'd raise your hand. And I would like to ask my colleague if there's someone who identifies as an adolescent girl or young woman, let's make sure they have the first question, please. We have an AGYW in the back. Any AGYWs? Want to ask a question? And if not, that's okay. We can go to someone else. Okay. We'll start back. Oh, I can start? Okay. Oh, thank you so much. My name is Christine. I'm um, here from Lighthouse Trust in Malawi. My question is from the is for the Zambia presentation on the recency testing. I'm just curious how if if your results were used for or if there's any collaboration with Dreams programming, was it used to inform or expand the Dreams program? Thank you. Okay, um, should I respond? Thank you, Christina, for your question. So yes, so one of the gaps that we identified um, that was not highlighted in the slide was 
um, there was poor bi-directional referral to dream centers. And that is one of the issues that was addressed during the public health response. I hope that answers your question. Great. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, my question is also for the presentation from Zambia. And, and when I looked at the presentation, it seemed to suggest hotspotting as a key strategy around identifying and addressing new infections uh, among uh, adolescent girls and young women. My question is, did you find any unique um, characteristics in those specific hotspots that you targeted? What is it that made them hotspots? And let's take another question now. Um, my name is Chido Zwachkwadu from the Biomedical Research and Training Institute in Zimbabwe. Um, my question is about the Safer Choices um, study as well as Chietza. I think in both of your recommendations, you spoke about um, a more holistic approach that includes self-development. And my question is, have you thought about how to integrate that within health services? So we're focused on testing for HIV, but how do we put other things into um, health services? Let's take one more question and then we'll have our replies. Uh, my name is Dr. Nkoma. I work for UNESCO in Zambia. Uh, we have a comment and a recommendation uh, towards the first presenter. My comment is that I totally agree that we ought to integrate these services, especially in countries where uh, there's chronic underfunding to the health sector. The recommendations are that uh, apart from integrating at service level, may we consider integrating at community initiative levels. We still have seen uh, initiatives to promote access to SRH at community level, but it's being, uh, it's being done as um, in isolation. And yet we could use that platform to integrate or to preach a message towards both HIV and SRH. Lastly, I would like to uh, recommend that at police level, may we also consider integration. Where policies are already integrated, may we consider seriously supervising these services using an integrated approach. Thank you. Thank you. Monica, could I turn it back over to you for the response from the first question? Um, thank you for um, your question. I didn't get your name. So uh, basically what happened is um, earlier in the presentation, I did mention that hotspot mapping is first done. So using geospatial um, uh, software or SatScan, that is a software that is using for, used for mapping the geographical sites, um, hotspots are identified. And then um, data is compared from the health facility and data that is generated uh, using the geographical mapping. And then the public health response is um, launched. So it's not specifically addressing adolescent girls and young women, but it's a public health response that is launched based on uh, recent infections that are identified in a particular location. So um, when the investigation is launched, that's when the team goes on the ground and actually investigates. And some of the gaps that I highlighted are those that uh, came out from the hotspot. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. In conclusion, I would like to give Natsai and Constance each a moment to respond to one of the last two questions because we are at time and I want to respect that. But if you could each address one of the last two questions, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'll just quickly go on to the uh, question about integrating um, self-development programs within health services. So what we currently have is that the peer navigators, they are area-based, they work within those communities and they provide health promotion as well as identifying other needs that our young people might have. So they just don't go around di uh, distributing condoms and HIV self-testing kids and linking uh, young people into care. But when they identify 
that they've got another need, for example, an ID, they refer them to the right services, but at the same time, they assess if they've got any health services that they might need and make an active referral into the system. So this is an electronic system and we've got a social worker on the ground, a nurse and a social scientist who's working together to ensure that when they identify a non-health need or a health need, they're able to refer and make sure that they encourage linkage into health services. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess I'll just build on what um, your response, Natsai, to respond to both um, Chido's question and also the other question um, raised at the end, because I think they're quite similar. So my understanding of both of the questions is, yes, integration with these other services, what a great idea, how do we do it? Um, and I think that's a really key question. I think that's something that we need to investigate and explore and research. Um, I think I, I have a few suggestions about it. So firstly, I think there is evidence um, so from South Africa about using cash transfers integrated within HIV programming and actually reducing HIV incidence. So that being a really great example of meeting these other needs alongside our, our kind of public health HIV priorities. So using examples that we have already, then having some you know, demonstration uh, projects or implementation science to show, to, tr to tr test out different models. And I think, Chido, you were mentioning about it being in health services. My thinking is it doesn't necessarily need to be based within health services. In Chiedza, that, as you know, it was community-based intervention, and so we need to think more broadly about where these interventions might um, be delivered. And then the question um, you also included, how do we do integrate integration at a policy level? And I think that's a wonderful question. And I wanted to raise an example that we're doing in Zimbabwe um, around adolescent well-being, where we're working at a policy level across five different ministries who work with adolescents, so the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of education, the Ministry of Social um, Welfare and the Ministry of Women Affairs and all the people who are working on ad with adolescents at that um, in these different ministries are coming together to see how can we um, try and meet adolescents' needs in terms of their well-being at a wider level at an integrated way. So I think it is possible. I think it's really challenging because we work in our silos, but I think that's a really good point. Thank you very much. Of course, the first and foremost thanks to our panelists. Such incredible presentations. The work you're doing is phenomenal and so appreciated. So please keep it up um, so that we can hear from you in the future. Uh, thank you for taking time for being with us today. I also want to thank my co-chair for taking the time to join us as well today. And last but not least, our technical people managing our sound and our slides. You all are doing such great work helping us with our logistics. Thank you as well. And wish you all a great ACASA.